Welcome to Inza Insights, a podcast brought to you by the International NGO Safety and Security As- uh, Association. In this episode, we'll be discussing the role of insur- the in- role insurance plays in NGO security management. Today, we bring back two previous guests to explore the topic. Lisa Oliveri, who's Director of Global Risk Management, Security and Operations at the National Democratic Institute, and Joe Gleason, who's Director of Risk Management Services at AHT Insurance. Welcome back to the show. How are you guys? Good. Thanks for uh, thanks for the invite. Good to be back here. Good to have you guys back. Um, Lisa, I'm going to start off with you, since I know you want to be the first uh, to, to get your insights in. Uh, why should international development and humanitarian aid organizations get insurance? Like what, 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 what from as a practitioner and user of insurance, what, what is the advantage of having insurance? Thanks, Omri. Always, uh, always happy to go first here and uh, good to be back. So I think this question is, it's a really great one to start with because I think, and hopefully Joe would agree, I think insurance is a tool that we use as practitioners. It's not the only mitigation that we use for risk management and, and in our programs, but it's certainly a powerful tool. And I think one that's gaining steam and attention from senior leaders at organizations and boards of directors. So for me, that's what comes top of mind, but Joe uh, would welcome your thoughts on that as well. Yeah, absolutely, Joe, same question. Yeah, look, you know, uh, at its at its core, insurance is designed to pay the costs associated with a range of issues that are, you know, it isn't it isn't an if it's going to happen, it's a when it's going to happen for most international development humanitarian organizations and NGOs, right? Whether that's a, a medical emergency or, or even a, a urgent medical issue, the doctor's bills, transportation, evacuation, it could be a the cost associated with the security evacuation or the response to a kidnap or wrongful detention. You know, insurance is there to help pay the costs associated with that. So I think at its at its most fundamental level, it is that um, that financial backstop. So it, it is crucial from a, from a fiduciary responsibility level. Different ways to, to organize that, and I think we'll talk about you know, various details as we go through today, but at its core, that's what it's there for. It's to, you know, they, the, the phrases help protect your balance sheet. Um, obviously, that also helps support the staff um, and others that you have out doing the work out, out in the field too. Excellent. Yeah. Um, Joe, this one's for you. What are, in following up on that, what are the insurance considerations for international development and um, humanitarian aid organizations operating in high risk areas? I mean, what are the things that they should be considering? Yeah. You know, it, the considerations kind of start at that same level, right? Uh, those, those kinds of hazards, whether it's again, a medical emergency, security evacuation, kind of you, you name it. And there are a whole host of policies and, I, and I'll, I'll kind of, you know, they include things like business travel accent, medical benefits abroad, expatriate medical, foreign voluntary workers compensation, um, the 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 you know kidnap ransom extortion, which has tons of different euphemisms like special risks and people security risks, um, but even specialized insurances like Defense Base Act insurance for for those funded under USAID programs, then local policies. Uh, for host country staff and even, you know, more niche policies like personal accident coverage through through London. So there's all of these different kinds of coverages that that can come into play, and they really depend on the nature of who's traveling or who 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 is being harmed, where, what they're doing. Is it business related? Is it you know uh, non business travel related, etc. Right? We don't need to go into excruciating detail there. I don't want people to fall asleep, but um, all of those are at play, um, and I think you know fine tuning those in sort of higher risk environments to who it is you're you're having do your work where um, with whom even sometimes starts to make a difference and and making sure that those policies are tailored to to your risks is crucial now taking it one step further in actual conflict environments and I think this is become really prominent since the start of the conflict in Ukraine, but even more so uh, with Gaza, this notion of of war risk insurance uh, has kind of come to the fore, become more prominent. Now, it's actually a misnomer, right? There is not war risk insurance. 
What it really is, is an exclusion on some policies, for example, a business travel accident policy, for harm related to uh, war-related hazards, right? So the example I always give, right, if, if you don't have war risk, the war risk exclusion removed, you can have a road traffic crash in Ukraine, and if it's just related to road conditions and hazards, that's covered. If, however, that same vehicle hits a landmine, that's conflict related, and unless that exclusion is removed, harm from that incident wouldn't be covered. So what can NGOs do? Well, you can buy back, or what really is pay extra, um, there's kind of no other way to say it, to have that exclusion removed. And in some environments, that may be an annual cost, right? An annualized cost. Increasingly in places like Ukraine and Gaza, very kinetic, ongoing military operations, it is usually a per day or sometimes assessed at a per week per person rate. Um, it, it, it is not inexpensive, and, and I think we'll touch on a little bit later, ways to help contain that cost, but it is an important element for, for organizations operating in high-risk environments to consider not only how will they cover that, I'll call it kind of generic risk of that road traffic crash, but even if they're not close to a conflict area, what happens if, right, they hit that landmine, that errant rocket hits where they are? Um, because sadly, these things do happen. Yeah, uh, I think they happen. And, and Lisa, uh, if you could, I was actually going to ask you, like, so what are some examples uh, of accidents or issues that have happened with you and how has insurance uh, come into play when during those incidents? So generally speaking, across a couple of different organizations that I've worked for, I think obviously road traffic accidents are quite common. And I think that there's this, an important coordination and communication dynamic there where the country teams hopefully have any insurances that are required locally, but then you have these institutional policies, which hopefully will provide coverage if not available locally. So that is certainly something that we've talked about at great length. Uh, we've used our business travel accident policy quite a bit. I would probably say that's, that's our number one usage and Joe can keep me honest as he knows our portfolio at NDI quite well. And so I would definitely say that's another, that's another policy that I've seen really take off and be very helpful for those business related you know, illnesses, security related issues, et cetera. So uh, I'm sure Joe has more on that, but hopefully, Omri, that's just yeah. a quick snapshot of the types of things that we use insurance for on a regular basis. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, another question for you, Lisa, and that's, you know, what in, in, in obtaining insurance, how do you go about and as an as a, as a implementer of the programs, how do you go about gaining getting insurance? Uh, do you go directly to the to the companies or do you have brokers or how does that work? So we do have a broker and we use AHT insurance. So uh, that full disclosure here, that's why Joe and I have uh, quite a, a close working relationship. I'm pretty sure Joe is on my speed dial. <laughs> and uh, but but just to give an overview, I mean, NDI does have a broker. We have regular monthly meetings, if not more often, to discuss the state of any claims that are underway, any sort of changing requirements coming from the insurance uh, underwriters themselves, and also forecasting and looking at where we plan on operating and what sort of insurance do we need to be looking into and what can we get in front of before it becomes an issue and we're, we're behind the ball on that. Uh, I would also say that, you know, we, it's, it's very helpful because we receive ongoing trends in the market and the AHT represents quite a few different international NGOs. So that is always helpful to have the benchmarking. And we also arrange regular updates to our, our board members. So we have a board audit and risk committee. And so not only does the board receive updates in those meetings, just on the state of where NDI insurance is, but they also receive orientation annually. And that's to ensure that all of our board members who sit on that committee have visibility into what our insurance policies are. And then they can ask questions if they have questions about the uh, the coverage limits, et cetera. 
And so it's, it's a very robust, I think, program. It's very helpful. And I'm happy, Amory, to get in a little bit later about just some of the benefits, I think, of having a strong broker and how important that is to your insurance portfolio. Yeah, yeah. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, Joe, Lisa mentioned, you know, the, the close relationship that you guys have. Um, and full disclosure, Joe and I also have a long term relationship, <laughs> not only because he's a, a former INSA board member, but also uh, happens to be uh, my broker as well. Uh, but I digress. Um, what, you know, what kind of insurance should NGOs be looking at specifically as a broker and as, as someone who comes from the NGO community previously? What should, what should NGOs be looking at as far as coverage? What are basic coverages that they, you know, that, that they should be looking at yeah. through either a broker or directly with an insurance provider? Yeah. And, you know, and I would answer that question sort of in, in a little bit in, in reverse. And this maybe speaks to our approach. I, I would say the first thing to do is, is to map out kind of where those core risks are, right? Are you an organization with a, a lot of country offices with a huge host country team and, and very few, if any, internationals? Um, or are you an organization that maybe is home office based with trip travel and events here and there, or are you some, somewhere in between, right? And, and most organizations are somewhere in between. But I think, you know, that's, one piece and then looking at sort of where you go what you do that you know the work you do how with whom really get a sense of what is your you know we refer to it as your risk profile or your risk picture because that's going to start to inform how you shape those insurance programs right and and i kind of give that gave that laundry list before a business travel accident program is is often key and and can do a similar thing with the medical benefits abroad. So I don't want to go too deep into specifics of policies, but those are designed to cover people traveling outside their home country on business, which almost every international development organization does. There's also um, work-related coverage. So, so if you're injured in the course of, of you know, they refer to as an occupational injury, um, here in the U.S., you've got workers' compensation, and internationally, there's a version as well. Um, kind of in, in a strange way, it's referred to as foreign voluntary workers' compensation, and the voluntary part is because you don't have to buy it. In the U.S., you actually have to buy workers' compensation. It's mandatory, legally mandated. Foreign voluntary workers' comp provides a similar type of coverage for people working internationally. As I mentioned, under USAID programs, the Defense Base Act coverage can provide a similar foreign or workers' compensation type coverage. So, you know, you want to make sure you're covering travelers. You want to make sure you're covering people for, for their occupational injuries. And for any long-term assignees, you want to make sure they've got health coverage as well, right? Business travel accident or medical benefits abroad is really designed for those urgent emergent cases that may come up while traveling. They're not designed for a a checkup while you're in, you know, Nairobi or wherever you are. They're designed for if you, you know, uh, you've got an urgent emergent issue. Wait till you get home to get the checkup. But if you're long term assigned, you are going to need that coverage. Um, so you got that piece. And then, as Lisa mentioned, host country nationals. Each each environment is going to have different options for insurance coverage. You know, we often, you know, it sounds like a bad joke. We often talk about using a road traffic crash. You know, if you had, uh, you know, two local national staff, a expatriate assignee and a home office traveler all in the same vehicle and there was a, a, a crash and let's throw a consultant in there too, right? Um, each of those people could have a different insurance response or certainly there would be multiple insurances that respond. And so what we often do is, is work with clients to kind of work that backwards, say, who works for you? What do you do? Where do you do it? And then let's map those insurances to make sure there aren't gaps, right? Ooh, that volunteer isn't covered. Um, or, oh, that, you know, that consultant was supposed to buy their own insurance, but hmm, they didn't really know what to buy. So they bought something that wasn't, you know, wasn't really applicable in the country where they traveled. So the whole host of coverages, again, I think the biggest piece is tailoring them um, to that, that risk profile. Yeah. Um, 
Lisa, Joe mentioned risk profiles. Um, and I guess I go there when you're, this goes sort of segues into another topic of the, the risk profiles that you might assign to, uh, employees, et cetera. What types of, uh, you know, insurances and why is it important? I should say, why is it important for security to be involved with the insurance buying process or, you know, uh, with, you know, as far as which ones they should get? Um, yeah. What, what is the security's role in that and what should it be? Thanks, Omri. I can tell you, I, I think there's a tremendous case to be made that security at a minimum should be included in the process for any insurance renewals and, and purchasing of those policies and, and at least the review of it. So I'm fortunate at NDI because uh, our security and operations team does play a pretty large role in our institutional policies, renewals and, and procurement. And but there is a there's also the policies that are managed under our HR department. So I do want to uh, acknowledge that. And I think that that is common at, at a couple of different organizations that I've encountered. I think that it's super important that security has an understanding of the various high level you know, coverages and exclusions that are out there. I think more and more I'm hearing stories about security teams working with business development teams when we're looking to work in new locations, for example. And as Joe said, you know, it's getting more complex in the market for conflict areas, et cetera. And some of those insurance decisions I've heard it have been really impacting an organization's approach and, mm -hmm. and go or no go to actually even go after that funding or, or go to work in those locations. So I think more and more, the better that we can understand and advocate and, and ask questions, uh, the more value add we have in those discussions about where we where the organization wants to be operating. And then furthermore, and Joe may expand on this, it's important for security to know what tools and resources are available through these policies, because there are a number of different services that could your organization could already be paying through its premium. And if you're not using them, then it, they're essentially, you know, it, it's it's money that you're wasting or you might be double spending if you're trying to procure those services through uh, other funds. So, Joe, I'm sure you have things to add to that. <laughs> no, but you you could tell I was just uh, itching to jump jump in there. No, I you know I think you hit on the the, the two key buckets. I, I would say the the first one a little a, a little more directly than you would, and that is, I think security teams have the best understanding of the risks, the, the, the particularly the people risks that organizations face. Right, you are the ones out there interfacing with program security teams. Um, to assess those risks, understand how they're being managed, and ultimately how they might unfold. So I think bringing that realistic sense um, is crucial. And, and I think that's a huge value of, of a security team's uh, role in helping build the insurance architecture. Um, it's, it's just that realism. I think the other piece is, as you noted, Lisa, is that when bad stuff happens, and again, it's when, not if, most often, it is a security team member who's going to pick up that call at 2 a.m. on the weekend of a long holiday weekend somewhere and start managing that response. And that may be through an, a third-party assistance provider. That may be with a security team on the ground. Having a working knowledge of how those insurances come into play is crucial so that there's not a stumble at that moment of, Oh, we've got this huge medical bill, or looking down the, you know, at, at possible medical bills, and not being sure and having to figure that out because they're, you know, it, it, you want all your energy to be focused on that incident management, supporting that person that's ill or injured, not trying to figure out, oh, are they covered? Are they, hmm, does it cover for this? But what about that? That becomes a huge distraction. So. Having that knowledge enables you as a security team member to move forward confidently and feel like, all right, let's do this. Let's move forward. We can, you know, if there's small questions that come up, we can resolve those in time. Excellent. Um, thank you, Joe. That's good. And, and you also give it that perspective of having been on our side of the, uh, uh, of the aisle uh, to, to show what, what can be, what is needed. Um, 
going back to something you said, Lisa, and that's that, and Joe, I'd like you to follow up on this too, uh, about resources that uh, insurance providers will actually often have. Uh, can you give us some examples of some that you've tapped into uh, and, and, and how it's benefited the organization? Sure. Thanks, Omri. I think some of the resources that we've used, I mean, even just on alerts from security providers through certain insurances, uh, there are also policies out there that will allocate a certain percentage of the premium for your various policies. And maybe Joe wants to go into that a bit more later, but, but there are training and, and also I've used funds from, from various uh, policies to look at security plans or crisis management plans. So really it's what I found is that if you don't ask, mm -hmm. then you're missing out because even if you know that you're provided a certain amount of funding, if you have a need and you're going to otherwise have to use organizational funds to pay for it, and it has a relationship to crisis response or you know security incident response, I think it's always worth asking and consulting with your broker and, and making the ask. And the worst that can happen is they say no, but I've also had some exceptions made mm -hmm. where we were able to save you know those unrestricted funds and to, to fund those through our insurance policies. So I think the the main takeaway here is if you have a need, I would I would make the ask and and certainly talking to your broker and getting their advice and experience with that particular carrier is a good idea. Cool. Thanks. And Joe. Same yeah, point. you know, and 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 both of you know you, you've heard me say this, but um I think that the the very tangible piece that often goes unused is the kidnap ransom extortion policies, almost all of them, all of them I'm aware of, have some percentage of the premium set aside for the organization to use. And it's usually somewhere in the 15% of your premium. So you know, that, that may be a sizable sum for some organizations. Now, there are some parameters on how it can be used. Typically, it needs to be used to support mitigation measures related to those risks, right? Kidnap, ransom, extortion, wrongful detention, um, security evacuation. It's a pretty wide um, range of things. Um, usually it has to be through a designated provider. Um, but, you know, I, I and, and look, I was guilty of it, um, leaving that money sitting on the table, um, you know, either because you can't quite get everybody together for an exercise or you can't, um, you can't pull together a group to do some sort of training. But I have found that the insurers are pretty flexible on how it can be used. You know, Lisa mentioned reviewing policies, right? If you've got a, a crisis management uh, plan that, you know, it hasn't been, hasn't been reviewed in a few years, that is a potential use. If rather than, you know, we often think of like a classic tabletop exercise, those are hard to schedule. If that isn't possible, even a review of procedures mm -hmm. um, might be a more manageable task to, to bring on. So, so I would say, kind of as, as Lisa said, right, there's some flexibility there. Ask. Um, the funds are there. Don't, don't, don't leave them. Um, the other piece I would say, it's, it's kind of related to this, is we're talking a lot about insurance, but obviously this community it, right? Insurance isn't all you need, right? Um, a, a big overlapping piece is assistance, mm. um, often third-party assistance, whether that's International SOS, Crisis 24, Helix, on-call, whole range of, of providers. That linkage between those third-party providers and insurance is crucial. Um, and it isn't just theoretical. It is a mechanical process. It has to be documented. It has to show in the provider's uh, operation procedures, but it can be a potential huge cost um, containment piece because if um, uh, it, you know if if that third party assistance provider has a relationship with a medical facility, they can pay those bills directly. The organization never sees that bill. Um, many insurers, with some not even arm twisting, just asking will cover the case fees of some of these providers. So those are pieces, again, it's, it's not pure insurance, but it is the overlap between an assistance and insurance, but it's an important one. And, and I think sometimes on the pure assistance side, it often gets left to, oh yeah, we work with every insurance provider. 
that may be great. Actually working out the nuts and bolts is really crucial so that when, again, that when you need it, it really works like it's supposed to. Yeah. Hey, Joe, can I, or Amri, can I jump in on that for two quick points before you move on? Thanks. Uh, The first is that, Joe, just to highlight here for anyone who's listening, to the point about utilizing providers that may not be written into that particular policy, it is still worth an ask. It's been my experience that if you have a specific provider that offers something that you have identified as being really critical to your program, there are exceptions that can be made. So always, always ask. Uh, the second point is just, Joe, as you were you were talking here uh, about the, the need to have that coordination, I just wanted to share a bumps and bruises experience where you, you may have all of these policies in play for your organization. You may have the providers teed up, but if they are not coordinated and if they don't set up direct billing agreements so that this can be a seamless experience in the middle of any crisis situation, you may be left to try and sort out Mm -hmm. those particulars. They might say, well, which policy are we supposed to use? Or we don't have a direct billing agreement, so now you have to pay the company and then seek reimbursement afterwards. So it's it's an efficiency thing as as -hmm. much as it is uh, just trying to ensure that you have all your bases covered. So those are just two points that I wanted to highlight. Well, that kind of segues into the question I was going to ask after this was that from your perspective, you know, how can insurance providers better tailor their products uh, to meet the specific needs of the, you know, international development humanitarian aid community? And I think part of that is what you just said, sort of making sure that they have arrangements either pre-assigned with these uh, service providers, but what other, you know, what other things could they do in addition to that? That's Joe or Lisa um, or both of you. I, I can I can jump in. <laughs> I'll I'll start on that one. You know there there are two places where I think um, uh, you know in addition to that assistance provider coordination, which I, I I will say has has grown and improved. It's it's you know still a work in progress. But there are two other areas where I think insurers um, can can improve and strengthen their ability to serve this community. One is a better delineation of true war risk environments. Um, And I have raised this with multiple carriers myself personally. Um, And and the classic example right now is the the geographic area often defined as Israel and then in parentheses West Bank slash Gaza, which ultimately means kind of the lowest or highest common denominator, however you want to think about it, the Gaza piece of that drives how both West Bank and Israel are viewed. And I think for those of us as practitioners, we know that those are wildly different risk environments. And, and you know, I'm going to be fair, right? Many insurers, um, especially those that focus on this community, know that too. It's kind of how to work it up their chain. Um, and, and I've had this con- conversation very specifically about Israel in the last I don't know, month with three different carriers to say, you know, applying a war risk exclusion to Jerusalem mm-hmm. is is completely uh, unnecessary given the current environment there versus, you know, obviously Gaza. And I think, you know, West Bank perhaps is a higher risk than, you know, than Jerusalem or Israel proper. So I think that's one area. Uh, the, the other example would be um, you know, Western Ukraine versus Eastern Ukraine, obviously much different environments. So pushing carriers to, to look more at a, a delineation or gradation of risks in a geography when they're talking about war risk is one. The other piece is more options for host country staff. Mm. Um, you know, I think uh, this community has always valued uh, the role of, of host country staff. They, they carry that highest burden in terms of work, also biggest risk exposure. Um, I do think in the last five years, 10 years, certainly there's been greater emphasis on sort of this equity of bringing those team members in line in some way. And it's never going to be exactly the same, right? Again, that car crash example where you may have four different insurances for four different people. 
but making sure there are options for those people that provide an appropriate level of care. So that would be the other thing that I, I think, and, and we do, uh, push carriers to, to do, to help, to improve on, to help be tailored to this community. Go ahead, Lisa. So Omri, I was going to try and answer this question from the, the end user, the practitioner perspective, mm-hmm. because Joe is obviously the expert on, on this subject. But I would say that in my years of experience, I have worked with a number of different brokers. And I would I would say that I think it's really important, and it goes back to what Joe was saying about, does your broker understand your business? Do they understand your exposure? Do they know what to be advocating for and building those relationships and ensuring that whatever questions they're asking and however they're portraying your organization to be prepared and fully capable of working in these higher risk environments, building up the confidence levels and hopefully uh, making you more insurable as an organization, I think is a really, from my perspective, it's truly um, demonstrative of why it's so important to have a trusted and a knowledgeable broker in this space. I can't stress that enough. Great. Um, one last question, and this is again for, for both of you. Uh, I'll, I'll pitch to Lisa since Joe answered the last time. Um, what are the ethical considerations surrounding insurance um, and, and our sector? Um, you know, particularly when it comes to conflict zones or, or disaster stricken areas? It's a really good question, Omri. I would, I mean, I, the first thing that comes to mind is really around, I think what Joe has been touching on, and that is how are we providing institutional support and insurances for largely our OS country national staff, because Typically, you find that your international staff have quite robust and and full packages and they, you know, but I think it is what comes to mind is around, for example, Joe, what 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 we ran into with some populations that had to relocate uh, from they they self-evacuated to different countries. And then at that point, being in another country, they may not have access to health care what options are there? Can the institution or organization themselves source insurance policies that will help be available, even if these host country national staff are paying it for it themselves? Mm. Do we have that obligation to assist them in finding that? Uh, I think for NDI, we, we, we've we demonstrated that that is something that we are interested in looking at in those extenuating circumstances. And then uh, but I'm sure Joe has more to follow up on this. But I think there are a lot of ethical considerations and moral uh, questions that come up around this area. Yeah, no, Lisa, I think you hit on the the core ethical moral piece of this, right? Is you know you can call it equity, uh, you know, how, however you want to title it. But I think this notion of providing that foundational support to those host country teams, it has been, I think to be fair, a patchwork in the past, um, both within organizations, but I certainly think within the community. Um, And so finding ways, and they may look different in different environments, right? And so that's that's not easy work, but it's important. Um, Finding ways to make sure that when that colleague who's sitting in the, you know, next to you is injured, that they are getting the appropriate level of care just as much as you are, um, right? And and I think that's a huge ethical consideration. Um, that focuses mo- mostly on the medical side, and I think that's pretty. I want to say it's easy to tackle. It's not easy to tackle. It's straightforward. Um, security evacuation is one that has come up, mm-hmm. um, and we certainly saw it uh, in in most prominently out of Afghanistan. Um, uh, but I think we saw it to a lesser degree out of out of Ukraine. I think that is going to be harder for the insurance community to get their arms around, and I think we need to be realistic about that. And I think in all of this, again, sort of reflecting this notion that insurance is a piece of this mosaic, but it isn't the only piece. So I think, you know, uh, sort of I would close on this notion. I think that, that support for the host country nationals is, is a key piece ethically. 
but I would say that ethical lens should be um, uh, looked at regardless of insurance coverage, right? Look at it through an ethical lens and then find insurance, Lisa, as you said at the very beginning, right, as a tool to support where it can. And, and so I think that's probably the better way to look at it. I do think the industry will inch along. I think I will give them a lot of credit. You know, no longer does the community look at NGOs as sort of, you know, grabbing a backpack and running off to a war zone. There's a much more sophisticated knowledge. And in fact, we have some carriers who tell us our NGO clients are far better prepared in higher risk environments than our mm -hmm. commercial clients who may be so bottom dollar focused, so independent that they have very little in place. So, so I, I, I think there is, there is interest and sophistication from insurers. The community will need to move them along, but um, yeah, helping protect and support those local national staff is that big ethical, uh, ethical concern and, and focus. Well, Lisa, Joe, thank you both so much for joining us again. We hope to have you back on another episode in the future. My guests today have been Lisa Oliveri, Director of Global Risk Management, Security and Operations at the National Democratic Institute, and Joe Gleason, Director of Risk Management Services at AHT Insurance. Thank you both for joining Insta Insights. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks, right. Omri. And uh, just a, a shameless plug here, Omri, but I do have it on good authority that there mm. could be a future session hosted by AHT on security and or insur insurance considerations for the security professional. There may be something coming down the line in case your listeners want to keep a, an eye out for that. Okay. Well, if it does come down the line or when it comes down the line, we'll be sure to post it on insa.org. Uh, thanks again for the shameless plug, Lisa, and we'll talk to you guys again soon. <laughs> Thank you. Austin. Thanks. Right. Take care. Bye, guys. Thank you to the Robert McPherson Fellowship for its generous support and donation helping to make these podcasts possible.